Um, so we, uh, we have been talking about groups. So we'll just write some of the words that we had so far. We have talked about groups. Then we talked about subgroups. Um, and so if we have uh, subgroups, we have uh, the decomposition of the group into cosets. Oh. And uh, we had uh, looked at normal subgroups. And if we have a normal subgroup, we had seen that uh, if we take the quotient, so the set of cosets, then we get that the quotient G mod H is, is a quotient group, is a group. So now we want to talk about the next uh, uh, kind of concept with uh, group homomorphisms. So it's a common thing in uh, mathematics. You <laughs> have some set with a structure, like a group, or a, a vector space, or topological space, and then the way you, one of the main things you use to study such set structure is the homomorphism between them, so the, the maps between such sets with the structure which are compatible with the, with the structure. And so for a group, the structure is that you have this product. So a, a homomorphism of groups will be one such that the product goes to the product. So that's very simple. <coughs> so definition. Uh, so if we take uh, two groups, so then a group homomorphism uh, from uh, A to B, so F e from G to H is a map. Uh, which, which is, uh, which sends the product to the product. So with um, phi of a, uh, phi of the product a times b is equal to phi of a times phi of b. So here the product is in g, and here the product is in h. So this is very simple. Um, So for instance, um, I mean, there are many examples of group homomorphisms. So for instance, if we have the, the map, the multiplication by k from z to z, which sends, uh, so and here z is uh, z we take with the addition. So I just write like this. So this is a group homomorphism. Because obviously this says that if we take, uh, so the map is uh, a number, an integer n is sent to k times n, and k for k some integer. And then the, you know, it's clear that if I take uh, I mean, it's a homomorphism because if I take n plus m times k, everybody knows that this would be the flaw that this is k times n plus k times m. Okay, so this is a simple example of a homomorphism. So <clears throat> now um, let us, so there are some simple remarks about this. So first, uh, a group homomorphism sends the neutral element to the neutral element and the inverse element to the inverse element. So let uh, C phi from G to H be a group homomorphism. and uh, say 
E, the neutral element of G, and uh, E prime, the neutral element of H, then uh, we have that phi of E is equal to E prime, and uh, for and uh, phi of A to the minus, oh, so phi of A to the minus 1 is equal to phi of A to the minus 1 for all A in A, for all A in G. Well, that's really, maybe I do not explain this because it follows directly. So if you want, this is an exercise. But it's kind of trivial. Um, and then another remark is that uh, if um, phi from G to H and psi from H to L are group homomorphisms, then their composition is a group homomorphism. Is a group homomorphism. And again, this is uh, direct from the definition, but maybe, you know, if you take, uh, so certainly you can take the composition, and then if you take psi composed with phi uh, of uh, A for any A in G. This obviously is psi of phi of A. And well, and now if I do this for a product, um, well, then I first, it's, you know, psi is a group homomorphism, so it's this. So phi is a group homomorphism, so it pulls out like this, and then we do the same again. Okay, so these are completely straightforward things. Then, <coughs> if we have um, a group homomorphism, we have two uh, kind of subgroups, uh, one in G and one in H, which uh, come with it. One is the kernel and one is the image. So the kernel consists of all the elements which map to the one in H, and the image uh, is you know, obviously the image. And so we can look at it. So definition. So we take a group homomorphism again. A group homomorphism. And uh, then we have, uh, so the kernel of phi is, uh, so kernel of phi, which is the set of all elements uh, which are mapped to the neutral element here. So this is the set of all A and G, such that phi of A is equal to 1. So with 1, I denote the neutral element in H. And um, <coughs> the other thing that we have is the image. The image is just what the image should be. The image of F is equal to the set. Uh, so phi is the set of all phi of A, where A is an element in G. So this is a subset of G, and this is a subset of H. And now, these are obviously not just subgroups, but not just subsets, but they are subgroups. And in fact, uh, we will see 
that the kernel is even a normal subgroup. This is quite simple. So, well, we can actually call this lemma. So, we have the same situation. T from G to H is a group homomorphism. Then the image of, it, of phi is a subgroup of H, and the kernel of phi is a sub is a, is a normal subgroup of G. Now, in fact, we will see in a moment. Uh, that in some sense uh, the normal subgroups or it's, it is true that the normal subgroups are precisely the kernels of homomorphisms of G to some other group. And uh, somehow the second statement is more important than the first. But in any case they are both quite simple. It's just checking the definitions. Well, so to be a subgroup, we have to see that the product of any two elements and the inverse of any element uh, lies in it. So if, um, say, h1 equal to phi of a and h2 equal to phi of b are elements in the image of phi, we have to see uh, to show that uh, h1, h2, and say h1 to the minus 1 are in the image of phi. No? The inverse of any element and the product of any two elements. Well, and this is kind of trivial, no, because uh, h1, h2 is equal to phi of a times phi of b equal to phi of a, b. Okay, and so it's in the image. After all, by definition, and h1 to the minus 1 is equal to phi of a to the minus 1. And we have uh, seen, well, actually, I didn't say it, but uh, it's trivial. And you can check it. And it's also in the image. So let's see for the kernel. That's not much more difficult. So. You have to see if two elements lie in the kernel, then the product lies there and the inverse lies there. That's to be a subgroup. So first we check it's a subgroup. So, so let uh, A and B elements in the kernel of phi. So that means that uh, there are elements in G and we have phi of A is equal to phi of b is equal to 1, then obviously phi of uh, a b is equal to phi of a times phi of b, which is equal to 1 times 1 equal to 1. Okay, And uh, if I same with the inverse, phi of a to the minus 1, by what we have seen, that's phi of a to the minus 1. And uh, <coughs> A maps to 1, so it's 1 to the minus 1, which is 1. Okay, so this is all very, I mean, in future I will not always do such trivial things, but it's still at the beginning, so. Anyway, one can see I'm just using the definitions. The last one is it's a normal subgroup. So what does that mean? So if we, it means that if we assume, so, so let H be an element in the kernel of phi, and A be any element in G, then we have to see that uh, uh, if we 
conjugate by it. So if I write A to C, A H A to the minus one is in the kernel of P. Well, you know, we just write it down. So we take phi of A H A to the minus one. This is uh, by the fact that it's a homomorphism. Phi of A, phi of H, phi of A to the minus 1. This is in the kernel, so this is 1. We know that this is the inverse of phi of A. So this is phi of A times phi to the A of minus 1 is equal to 1. OK, so <coughs> we see. Um, so anyway, so it follows directly from the definitions that the image of phi is a subgroup of H and the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of G. As usual, when we have a morphism, we have homomorphisms, we have isomorphisms, so a different definition. Somebody already lose some of uh, so <coughs> so a homomorphism phi from G to H is called uh, an isomorphism if it is bijective. So it's easy to check uh, that um, if um, so, if phi is an isomorphism, then its inverse map is also homomorphism that follows. So, so if phi is an isomorphism, then phi to the minus one, so just the inverse map, is also a homomorphism and therefore an isomorphism. E to the minus one is the map, so it's the composition with it is the identity. And uh, <coughs> um, it's also easy to see that, so we can say G and H are called isomorphic if there is an isomorphism from G to H. I may be right, denote this G is isomorphic to H. And it's straightforward that this is an equivalence relation. obviously G is isomorphic to itself by the identity. Um, if G is isomorphic to H via phi, then H is isomorphic to G via the inverse map of phi. And uh, the composition of isomorphisms is easily seen to be an isomorphism. I mean, it's uh, the composition of homomorphisms is a homomorphism. And then uh, if both of them are bijective, the composition is bisective. So that's trivial. OK. And so if one wants, uh, you know, one, one could say that you know, the one aim of uh, group theory could be to describe all isomorphism classes of groups. It's a somehow impossible task. But uh, <coughs> you know, that could be one thing that one could be trying to do. Um, So just uh, to <clears throat> you know, just as a remark, um, so if um, if say phi 
from G to H is a homomorphism of groups. Then we know that the image of V is a subgroup of H. We just said it a minute ago. And um, so one can always view phi, phi as a surjective group homomorphism uh, phi from G to the image of phi. So therefore, when <coughs> we can, in some sense, by replacing H by its image, always assume that uh, our group homomorphism is subjective. And so in order, so if, it, if the morphism is injective, then it will be an isomorphism onto its image. And so it's somehow important to know what is the criterion for a homomorphism, a subjective homomorphism, to be an isomorphism. And we can see this in terms of the kernel of the map. So the, uh, the homomorphism will be injective if and only if its kernel consists only of the neutral element. So lemma that uh, phi from G to H be a group homomorphism Uh, and phi is injective if and only if the kernel of phi is equal to 1, where 1 is the neutral element of G. So in particular, if I have a subjective group homomorphism from G to H, it will be an isomorphism if and only if its kernel consists only of 1. Okay, so this is all. I think today we don't really have any real proof, so but we can look at this elementary argument to kind of practice. So, so we assume phi is injective, and we want to show the kernel is equal to 1. So we denote, say, by E, the neutral element element of H, we have already denoted by 1 the neutral element G. <coughs> so obviously we know that F of 1 is equal to E. That's true for any, phi of 1 is equal to E. That's true for any group homomorphism. So uh, thus it follows that the kernel of phi contains 1. We have to see the other inclusion. That, it, that every element which is mapped to the neutral element is 1. So f is injective, but we have assumed. Thus, it follows. So if it's still called phi, even in rho. phi is injective, thus phi of a is different from phi of 1, which is e for uh, A different from 1. In other words, uh, the kernel is precisely 1. OK, so this is kind of stupid. And now the other direction which is, so to speak, the non-trivial direction, but it's not very non-trivial. So we assume the kernel is 1. So let's take two elements which are mapped to the same element.
we have to see that A is equal to B. Um, so say we multiply by V of B to the minus 1. So it follows that V of A B to the minus 1 is equal to V of A V of B to the minus 1 is equal to 1. Because if I multiply this side by V to the minus 1, I get 1. And so as the map is injective, no, as the kernel is equal to 1, we get that AB to the minus 1 is in the kernel. So it follows that AB to the minus 1 is equal to 1. So that means that um, uh, B to the minus 1 is the inverse of A, which is the same as saying that A is equal to B. Okay, so the map was injective. Okay. <coughs> Just... Um, Let's look at one uh, simple example of an isomorphism, which I leave uh, as an exercise. So let uh, say f from m to n be a bijection of sets. Then say uh, whatever I write it f star from um, the symmetric so the set of permutations of the set M so the isomorph the bijections of M to itself is it in wait, 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 wait. I have to see to the same thing for M is an isomorphism so which map so this means, so if I have uh, such a map, so assume an element here I call sigma, this is mapped to uh, what is it, f to the minus 1 composed sigma composed f. So with um, <coughs> I have a map from n to itself. Let me see whether it's correct. So I want to apply it to an element in M. So I actually don't do that. Um, uh, maybe I do it even just like that. So I uh, try again. So I take an element in here. So a map from, uh, I don't know, from <laughs> So let's just see. I mean, maybe I write the diagram. I seem to be a bit stupid. So we have, I mean, we have here this f goes from m to n. And assume we have here this map uh, I think it's just OK. We have this map sigma from m to itself. And we want to find, uh, so here we have f, f again n. And so we just want to, instead of uh, doing, we associate to this um, so so the sigma is here. So to the sigma, we apply this thing where we first apply, no, it was correct. So we first uh, take an element of n, we apply uh, f to the minus 1, we go here, we apply sigma, and we apply f again. And that's what it is. So, 
So this is, <coughs> so whenever we, we have a bijection from M to itself, will give us another bijection here by you know, doing this kind of conjugation. Um, this gives us, a, so this I claim is an isomorphism. It's easy to check it's a homomorphism because you, uh, if you, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, you can check it's a homomorphism because if you, have the composition of sigma and tau. You can put f f to the minus one in the middle, and you get this. And uh, it's I, it's an isomorphism because obviously uh, you can, if you do the same with f to the minus one, this will give you the inverse map. This isomorphism inverse is uh, sigma goes to um, f of minus one composed with sigma composed with f. So in particular. If M has finitely many elements, uh, then we get that the symmetric group, so the set of permutations of M, is isomorphic to uh, the symmetric group in as many letters as M. So the permutations of the set 1 to M, 1 to the number of elements of M. Okay, so these are simple, this simple example. I didn't do all the details, but you can check it. So, <coughs> finally, um, we want to see that if we have a, so we want to come to the fact that the normal subgroups are precisely the kernels of uh, group homomorphisms that you can kind of uh, okay you can somehow factorize through the kernel of homomorphism so we'll see that in a moment so let me write this down so first this is very easy lemma let g be a group Maybe I will first kind of say, so let G be a group. And uh, say N in G be a normal subgroup. Then uh, we know that uh, G mod H is a group. No? G mod N is a group with the obvious map. And uh, <coughs> so we have, we'll call pi from g to g mod n, which is the map that we had before. We associate to an element g here, the map g n. This we call the canonical projection. And it's kind of clear from the definition that this will be a group homomorphism because we have precisely defined the group structure here in such a way that it's a group homomorphism. So this is, we have the, the uh, dilemma um, so G is a group, N is a normal subgroup, the natural map pi from g to g mod n is a subjective group homomorphism
with kernel n. So in particular, we see that we get uh, that the normal subgroups are precisely the kernels of group homomorphisms, because we know that the kernel of a group homomorphism is a normal subgroup. And on the other hand, this says that uh, if we have a normal subgroup, we find kind of we find a group homomorphism of which it is the kernel. Um, well, there's not very much to say here. It's basically all by definition. So, so first, by definition, we know that if A and B are elements of G, then pi of A, B is equal to, so I just write it like this, pi of A times pi of B is equal to A n times B n. This was how it was defined. So pi of A is A n, pi of B is B n. And the, 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 product, the multiplication was defined precisely in the way so that this is A B n, which by definition is equal to pi of A B. So this says it's a group homomorphism. We have precisely defined the structure of the group on the of the quotient group so that this becomes a group homomorphism. And then so what's the kernel? We have um, that A is in the kernel of pi if and only if uh, well if its image if uh, a times n is equal to n. A times n consists of all. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this means in particular that uh, so a so that that means that uh, a times n is an element in n for all n in n. So, uh, so for instance, uh, it follows that A times 1 is an element in n. So, A is an n. And conversely, if A in n, then uh, certainly A times n, because n is a subgroup, A times n is an n for all n in n. Okay, so this is very simple. So thus, we find that the kernel of pi is indeed equal to n. Because it consists for these a, <coughs> such that a times n is equal to n. Okay, so now we come to something which is not more difficult, but still I call it the theorem. So the homomorphism theorem, which says that if we have a uh, surjective group homomorphism, um, then no. Yeah, and we have some, <coughs> then we can divide by its kernel and get an isomorphism. So we can factor out the kernel. So this is a theorem. I mean, it's a big, much to call a theorem, but it's often called homomorphism theorem, sometimes first isomorphism theorem or second isomorphism theorem. I never remember, but in Germany it's called homomorphism theorem. Which says that, uh, so let phi from G to H be, a, say, a subjective group homomorphism. with kernel k. Uh, then 
there exists an isomorphism see phi bar from um, G mod K to H uh, such that if I take uh, this map, we first apply, so if we take phi, this is equal to applying phi bar after the natural projection pi. So in other words, we have this diagram. We can either take phi directly to go to H, or we can take the natural projection to G mod K and uh, apply this map phi bar here, and this diagram commutes. So it, it, we get the same whether we go use this map or the composition of these two. So in some sense, this statement says that um, if you want uh, up to you know, this isomorphism here, a uh, subjective group homomorphism is uh, the same as the, you know, you know up to composing binding isomorphism, it's the same as uh, you know, just the uh, dividing by, uh, by a normal subgroup. Okay, so we can always, so we can always make a subjective group homomorphism into an isomorphism by dividing by the kernel. Okay, so let's see how this goes. It's actually quite simple. So we see that there exists such a map. In fact, it's also unique, but this, uh, um, so which is given, so which satisfies this. And so the only reasonable thing how we can try to prove it is to use this as a definition for phi bar and then see whether it works. Ah. Yeah, maybe, so just uh, to claim it, so in particular, we have that uh, H is isomorphic to G modulo the kernel of P. So let's prove it. So we, we want that uh, phi is equal to phi bar composed with pi. We want to find the phi bar with this property. So the reasonable thing is to use this as a definition. So what does it mean? So that means for all elements A in G, we should have that phi of A is equal to phi bar of P of A, which is just phi bar of A plus A times K, no? of this, uh, so the, the natural projection is that. So <clears throat> that means the reasonable thing is to, to do is to say that we define phi bar of A K to be phi of A. We have a, so this, I mean, this formula forces us to make this definition because we have required this to be true. And so we make this definition. And now, obviously, we have to check whether it makes sense. So the first thing we have to check whether it's well defined because we have defined here phi bar on an equivalence class in terms of the representative A. So it must be well defined. It should be independent of A. So, so first, phi bar is well defined.
So what does it mean? So in other words, if uh, AK is equal to BK, then we need, we have to show that um, uh, phi of A is equal to phi of B. Well, but that's kind of trivial, no? Because, uh, so <coughs> what do we have? So, so <coughs> that AK is equal to BK means that there is an element of K such that B is equal to A times this element. So, A large K equal to B large K means there exists an element, say small k, in large k, such that a is equal, so or maybe b is equal to a times k. So then, what is phi of b? Is equal to phi of a times k, is equal to phi of a, times phi of k, because it's a group homomorphism. And so this is phi of a times 1 equal to phi of a. So that's fine. So we have indeed seen that if a k is equal to b k, then phi of a is equal to phi of b. So it's well defined. And the second statement is that it's a group homomorphism. But that's basically trivial too. Because we have made our definitions in this way. So phi is a homomorphism, phi bar is a homomorphism. How does it go? Um, well, if I take phi bar of AK, say, times BK, then according to our definition, so first, uh, this is equal to phi bar of AB times K, because that's how the group structure goes. And this, uh, we had said, is phi of AB, phi of AB equal to phi of A times phi of A. And uh, according to our definition, phi of A is equal to phi bar of AK. OK. And that shows it's a group homomorphism. And it's clear that um, phi, is subject, phi bar is trajective. Because uh, the image, after all, is the same as the image of phi. You know? Because we send phi of, we send uh, a k to phi of a. So we get the whole image. Phi of A is equal to phi bar of AK. So the image is the same. And um, what is the and we also want to show that phi bar is injective. So in other words, we need to show that the kernel of phi bar is equal to the unit element uh, in this quotient, so it's 1 times k, so to the neutral element. But we have, but by definition, 
we have that um, uh, an element A is in the kernel of phi. Well, if and only if phi bar, so A plus AK, is in the kernel of phi, if and only if uh, phi of A is equal to 1, no? because after all, um, uh, that was... Um, <coughs> you know, the, the phi bar of AK is equal to phi of A. And so this is if and only if A is an element of K. And uh, this is equivalent to AK is equal to K. Okay, so the kernel is... Uh, just this. So it's uh, we get this isomorphism, and by definition, by our definition, we know that this holds because we have precisely said so by definition. Bar, we have that phi is equal to psi to phi bar composed with phi. Okay, so this is this. this. Are there any uh, questions or comments until now? No. Um, So um, let's do some simple example. For instance, example, let um, say G be a cyclic group um, of order k. So the number of elements is k. Uh, then um, g is isomorphic to uh, z mod k times z. So k is some positive integer. So <coughs> that's quite clear. We take a generator of uh, g. So that means it's an element such that we get G by just taking all powers of A. So that means that G is equal to the set uh, A to the N, N in Z. And so, and uh, we know, so, I can maybe define a map uh, phi from Z to G, which sends uh, an element N in Z to A to the N. No? Then we, we have seen in the first lecture that I have A of N to the n plus m is equal to a to the n times a to the m. So that means this is a group homomorphism. 
And uh, G says, uh, this statement here says there's a surjective group homomorphism. And what is no. what's the kernel? I mean, we have actually seen before that uh, the order of G, the order of G in this case is equal to the order of A. So, which is equal to the minimum over all k omega at zero, such that a to the n is equal to one. Well, maybe I call it n. So, <coughs> so, <coughs> and this is the number k. So. <coughs> So we see that uh, thus uh, we have that k is an element in the kernel of phi. And uh, there's no uh, smaller n bigger than 0 that is in the kernel of phi. So k is minimal. positive integer with this property. On the other hand, we see that if uh, k is in the kernel, then also all multiples of k are in the kernel. Because uh, you know, if I have a to the k is equal to one, then a to the two k will be one times one, and so on. And <clears throat> on the other hand, if this was not equal, I would find a smaller element, and it's easy to see. So, so. can find a smaller positive element. In kernel of phi. So I mean, but just if n is in the kernel of phi, then you see from this that you know, a to the k is always equal to 1. So you can multiply by any power. Uh, by any uh, so by any power of a to the k, so it follows that um, n minus d times k is in the kernel of phi for all d and z, and so we can do division with rest. So if um, n is not a multiple of k, um, we find that uh, there exists a d such that n minus dk is uh, bigger than 0 and smaller than k. And this is a contradiction to our choice of K. Okay, and so we have that the kernel is k times z. And so in other words, we find that uh, we have a subjective homomorphism from z to the cyclic subgroup generated by a to this g, 
whose kernel is k times z. So uh, uh, g. Because, uh, yeah? Because I don't see. Uh, here. Yes? Uh, you cannot see it. Where is it? Otherwise, yeah, so my. Okay, so it was not a mathematical question. Okay, because otherwise we have this. So, <clears throat> so thus it follows uh, that uh, G is isomorphic to Z mod KZ, because we have a subjective homomorphism from Z to G whose kernel is KZ. Okay, now we want to say Well, it's not very, I want to say a little bit about automorphisms. It's not very, um, so, <clears throat> So an automorphism is, a, a, so first an endomorphism, endomorphism of G is a, a homomorphism of G to itself. It is an isomor. It is an uh, automorphism if it's an isomorphism. <laughs> now we'll see in a moment that. The automorphisms of a group form by themselves a group, and um, we describe some of these automorphisms. So, so I will actually denote out of G to be this in the moment the set of automorphisms of G. That would be a bit tautological, but anyway, yeah. In fact, it wouldn't make sense. Okay. Yeah, isomorphism. So now, so we first have the remark. So we want to see that the automorphisms of G are a group. So I claim that uh, out of G is a group, it is a subgroup of uh, just uh, the bijections of G to itself, so a subgroup of S of G. Oh, remember that S of G was just a set of all maps which are bijective. Well, so in order to check this, we have to see um, that uh, a composition, so the, the group uh, structure here of the, uh, uh, the group of permutations of G is just uh, by composition. So we have to see that the composition of two automorphisms is an automorphism. This is obvious. No? 
we know that the composition of isomorphisms is an isomorphism, and if it goes from G to D, G, it goes from G to G, and that's it. And the inverse of an automorphism is an automorphism. Again, that's obvious. Okay, so this is clear. We have already proven it. So, <coughs> now we want to uh, look at the special case of automorphisms, which are the so-called inner automorphisms. Yet somehow to every element in the group, we can associate an automorphism of the group by kind of what one could call conjugation by that element in the group. So this is the following statement. So let G be a group. Maybe quite definition. Let G be a group. And uh, A. G. So for every two H D. So first we note that um, so the map which I call tau A from G to G, which sends an element uh, B to a, B, A to the minus 1 is an uh, automorphism of G. So first, it's a, obviously a homomorphism, <coughs> because if we have a, a tau A, of uh, B times C. This is, um, um, no, yes. So if you have two elements B of C of G, then it should uh, be compatible with product. If you have two elements B of C of G, then it should be compatible with the product. This, by definition, is A, B, C, A to the minus 1. And then we can multiply suitably with 1. No, a, b, a to the minus, and so this is tau a of b times tau a of c. So this shows that this is a homomorphism, and uh, it is bijective because we can immediately say what the inverse is. So if we take uh, tau a to the minus 1, Then this is, uh, by the same uh, statement, this is also a homomorphism of G to itself. And uh, it's clear that tau A, comp that this will be equal to the identity. And conversely. I mean, obviously, you just write it down, and you see immediately that this will be the case. So this is indeed an automorphism. And then um, so an automorphism um, um, an 
automorphism is called an inner automorphism. So say v from g to g is called an inner automorphism. If it is of this form, so if phi is equal to tau a for some a in g, so I want to briefly describe what. I mean, these inner automorphisms. So one can maybe see, for instance, if, um, for example, if um, uh, G is abelian, is commutative. then uh, the inner automorphisms are just the identity. So I maybe should uh, say I denote by in of G the set of inner automorphisms. Now we want to show that this, uh, well, anyway, if G is commutative, then obviously the set of inner automorphisms of G consists just of the identity of G. Because uh, as um, uh, G is commutative, we send B to A, B, A to the minus 1, which is the same as A, A to the minus 1, B, which is B. So every B is sent to itself. Okay, <clears throat> so now we want to, um, where is it? So we first want to claim A proposition that the set of inner automorphisms of G is a normal subgroup of all the automorphisms of G. Well, this is actually more a remark. Maybe I make it a remark. So we just check the definition. So we have to see it's a subgroup, and it's a normal subgroup, so we just check the definition. So the inner automorphisms are precisely those which are obtained uh, in this way. So if we take... Um, So we do have that it's a subgroup. We have to show uh, so we have then if A, B, I, and G, then tau A and tau B are in automorphisms. So we have to show that their composition is an inner automorphism. And um, also that tau A to the minus 1 is an inner automorphism. But uh, so far, uh, we have already seen that tau A to the minus 1 is equal to tau A to the minus 1. So this is certainly an inner automorphism. We just saw it 
a minute ago here. And um, if we, uh, so otherwise we have to see if we take tau A composed with tau B, it applied to some element X, so X is an element of G. Then what is it? So it's tau A of uh, B, X, B to the minus one by definition, which is uh, A, B, X, B to the minus one, A to the minus one. And we know that this is the inverse of A, B. So So in other words, this is tau of A times B. So this is also an inner automorphism. And then finally, we want to see, so this shows it's a subgroup. Um, actually, I needn't have, well, whatever. And now we want to show it's a normal subgroup. So that means if we conjugate with any element in, with any automorphism, it should still, we should still get an inner automorphism. So let phi from G to G, no, G, be an automorphism. We have to see that um, if we take phi tau a phi to the minus one, this is an inner automorphism. So for all a in G. Well, we can just compute what it is. So same way as before, we see what it does to any element. So, well, so let x be an element in G. So we take um, phi tau a phi of x, uh, phi to the minus 1 of x. So this is, uh, so first we apply phi to the minus 1 of x. Then we apply tau a to it. And then we apply phi to it. Now phi is a homomorphism. So it, you can pull out the product, goes to the product. So this is phi of a, phi of phi to the minus 1 of x, phi of a to the minus 1, which is the same as phi of a x phi of a minus 1. In other words, we have tau of phi of a. OK, so this is also an inner automorphism. And finally, we want to give um, an explicit description of the inner automorphism as a as a quotient of the group itself. So definition. So the we have G as a group. So the center of G, which you also have in an exercise, is um, I think I use I don't know whether I use the same notation, is Z of G which is the set of all elements in G, such that AG is equal to GA. So I think you were required to prove that that's a normal subgroup of G. Now, unfortunately, I will 
from the proof that I give, uh, this will also follow, but maybe you can try to give a different proof. <laughs> I mean, um, so, so proposition we have that uh, C of G is a normal subgroup. of G, and um, the group of inner automorphisms of G is equal to the quotient of G divided by the center. Isomorphic, well, whatever, yeah. Well, so what I will do is I <coughs> so I just have to give a surjective homomorphism from G to the inner automorphisms whose kernel is C of G. Then this proves at the same time that Z of G is a normal subgroup and that this identity holds. So proof. Well, and we know what the homomorphism is, you no? Know? After all, the inner automorphisms are given by sending an element A in G to tau A. So tau, which sends A to tau A, is hopefully a homomorphism. So let tau from G to in of G, which sends A to tau A. Okay? So the claim is. Uh, <coughs> We actually have seen, I just wiped it out, but it's trivial. We have seen it, have seen that tau of AB is equal to tau of A composed with tau of B. I hope that's correct. Um, so we have that tau is a homomorphism. So now we only want to, we have to show it is, by definition, it is subjective. Tau is subjective because the inner automorphisms were precisely those automorphisms which could be obtained as tau A for some A and G. So by definition, it is subjective. So the only thing we have to check is the, what the kernel is. So the claim is that the kernel of phi, kernel of tau, is equal to uh, the center of G. OK, and then by the homomorphism theorem, we have this. So, so assume we have an element A, which lies in the kernel of tau. So by definition, this is if and only if, if I take tau A, this is equal to the identity of G. This is equivalent to saying that for all elements G and G, we have A G, A to the minus 1, is equal to G. No? No, tau A is the map which sends G to A, G, A to the minus 1, and we want this to be the identity. So that's what it is. And this is equivalent. We can always multiply on this side by A, that for all G in G, we have that A, G is equal to G, A. And this, by definition, means that A is in the center. So um, we see, therefore, that the kernel of tau is the center of, of G. And therefore, um, 
Indeed, as the kernel of a group homomorphism, it's a normal subgroup, and the inner automorphisms are G divided by the center of G. Okay, so um, was just some small then propositions and so on. It was just examples of uh, the definition, and um, <clears throat> so maybe that's enough for today. Next time, I will talk about uh, you know uh, actions of groups on sets and uh, what one can see with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>